Okay, let me, let me just give you a brief background. Of course, you can tell I'm a little tired. A little brief background. Uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, in the process of looking for an uh, engineer construction company to help us with our onshore abandonment refurbishment for our natural gas pipelines, we ran across an individual at an engineering company by the name of Ann Keller. And Ann Keller was in the, I guess, the finance side of, of uh, Jacobs Engineering. And we were looking to find somebody to help us do our retrofits and refurbishments. And... Uh, built a small relationship with Ann at the time. Well, about eight months later after we met Ann, or after I met Ann, she contacted myself and said, hey, I've got an idea that maybe there's an opportunity to look at buying some assets in the pipeline space in the Gulf of Mexico. Would you have an interest? Again, I said yes, because I like looking at deals, and I'm always trying to poke around finding opportunity. And we ended up finding out that uh, the idea that was uh, brewing was to maybe buy some pipelines in the Gulf of Mexico with the idea that you could take and change the use or change the manner by which those pipelines were in fact currently uh, conditioned with the idea of, again, creating a revenue model and, and uh, creating some value. Uh, I can't even remember the timeline to be specific, but I was very fortunate that over about a three or four month period, I was able to uh, look at the due diligence, meet with Ann uh, Keller, I met her partner, Diane Dundee, and they had a, a management company managing midstream assets. Uh, I'll fast forward to the current present time. We've been at this two and a half years, is that right? You've been at three, yeah, two years. For uh, Diane and myself, it seems like it's been about 10 years because uh, it's been a really, it's been an interesting project, but the, the long story short is we have successfully put under contract the right to buy uh, producing pipelines in the Gulf of Mexico. We're buying from Tennessee Gas Partners, as Barbara said, which is no longer around. Tennessee Gas Partners was acquired by El Paso and in the acquisition attempt, what we've done is now have it under contract. We've submitted to FERC, the Federal Energy Regulation Commission in Washington, D.C., to change the use of those pipelines, which, if successful, and we believe we will be, uh, we will have an extremely valuable asset that is worth a lot of money that we've paid pennies on the dollar for that should be a substantial asset for us going forward. So what I've been doing is looking at the Gulf of Mexico because of the publicity from the drilling moratorium because the uh, comments that the Gulf of Mexico was in a major decline because the Macondo spill last year, which was the worst oil spill in U.S. history, uh, offshore, you kind of wonder, you know, is the Gulf of Mexico alive? Is, it, is the shell plays making the Gulf of Mexico no longer a viable concern? And statistically, uh, there has been a big decline in the Gulf over the last 10 to 20 years as far as gas goes. Uh, there's two relative uh, interest levels in the Gulf. It's what they call on the shelf and then off the shelf. On the shelf, the water's fairly shallow, two to 300 feet deep. And my professor's gonna correct me when I'm wrong, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wink at her when I think I'm wrong. Uh, about two to 300 feet deep. Uh, and so drilling the wells there is not that difficult because you only have to get down to 200 feet to get to your wellhead and your equipment. But you may drill a 30,000 foot well. So 200 foot of water, then you may drill another 25,000 feet down to your formation. When you get off the shelf, you're now dealing in three, four, 5,000 foot of water. And that really is a, a, a very expensive proposition and requires great, great care because it's obviously you're dealing with 5,000 foot of water. You can't send a scuba diver down to go check out and see how your wellhead looks. Um, one thing I've learned about the Gulf of Mexico and I've learned about uh, the pipelines in pertaining to the Gulf of Mexico, it's a very complex business. And the complexity is not only with regard to the rules and regulations in the Gulf of Mexico, but it also has to do with just what we've been talking about today, the logistics, how gas flows, who processes what, how do you get paid? And uh, what I find about the pipeline business that is so attractive to me, um, it's almost like, uh, I guess, joining a fraternity in college. You owe everybody in the fraternity something sooner or later, and it's all payable before you ever enjoy yourself. Because the fact is, is that everybody from the time that gas gets in that wellhead to the finally gets burned at the tip in the house, there's probably about 40 people making fees along the way. And you just got to figure out which part of that system you fit in and which part of that, that uh, food chain you want to be involved in. Do you want to be a gatherer, picking up and gathering gas from producers and shipping it down the line? Do you want to be a, a FERC regulated line where you're actually a transportation company or you're in the processing business? So how that's going to affect the presentation I'm doing today is I just want to show you what I think is going on in the Gulf and it's pretty exciting and uh, we've been very fortunate and lucky. I, I, Diane and I will call each other sometimes when things look like they're getting a little off track or maybe we're both having a bad day or we just want to kind of share about uh, what we're looking for as far as progress in our acquisition. But as I've been uh, having these conversations and following our own investment opportunity, it's been amazing to me to see what's transpiring in the Gulf, and it really is pretty exciting if you can put it in, in the, a general context. 
So let me get started real quick if I can. Let me find this little buzzer. The Gulf of Mexico, dead or alive? Um, and that's really the issue. The issue is, is are we in a major decline? Or are we going to see some increased production? And I can tell you what they're finding in these deep waters is really exciting. They're finding some major oil fields and some big discoveries. And it looks like some of the recent discoveries on the shelf in the shallow water uh, looks like it could be some major discoveries as well, which could change the entire Gulf relative to volume output, depending on how the geology plays out. So far, it looks very encouraging. Gulf of Mexico producing oil and gas fields. Uh, the first thing I tell you is the Gulf of Mexico is, is similar to me to like the Bakken trend in that the Gulf of Mexico is just a big checkerboard. They've cut up all the blocks in the Gulf and it's all controlled by either the state or the federal government. And so when you're out in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you have uh, this big checkerboard pattern and underneath this checkerboard pattern is all the 3D seismic and geology and all the, the necessary components to find these different oil and gas fields. But the more research I did in the Gulf, I mean, you would be surprised if you ever just looked at how many rigs and platforms and pipelines are in the Gulf of Mexico. In Carl's presentation, you saw this cluster coming out of the southern part of the United States. Well, most of that starts out in the Gulf of Mexico, comes back onto shore and gets to a connection point. So you might have a spider web of gathering lines, comes back to one connection point, and then it's headed somewhere to be processed or down to an end user somewhere up in the northeast or wherever it's going. But if you take a look at the, the fields, uh, you have sort of a somewhat of an outline. I don't know if you see the, this point or not. You have an outline of the shelf, and then you have these big deep uh, fields or these larger sized fields out in the deep water. Well, it just makes sense. You're going to go drill a $180 million well off in the deep water. You better find a lot of oil because it's not going to be worth it otherwise. So there's a big economic exchange from shelf versus off the shelf. And so it, it dramatically changed. I'm sure there's a ton of red dots that would be out here in the deep water if it wasn't in deep water. They just can't afford to make it make sense. Gulf of Mexico. Now, this is I, I get this from different websites, but what I, what the last thing I read was there's 642 million barrels of oil between 0 and 999 uh, feet of water, improved reserves. Okay? Once you start getting deeper, uh, you end up with a total of about 4 billion barrels of oil in total reserves from zero to about 5,000 plus feet in the, in the Gulf. And you know, I found about four different sites and they all had kind of varying numbers of reserves, but this seemed to be the most consistent range of production. But we've got a lot of oil in the Gulf of Mexico and with the new discoveries off the continental shelf, that number's gonna continue to increase in substantial numbers. I mean, they're not finding a little bit of crude oil, they're finding a lot of crude oil. In the last 18 years, the Gulf of Mexico added five billion barrels of oil from new fields and infill development. And 18% uh, of the U.S. reserves comes out of the Gulf of Mexico as far as crude oil is concerned. So it's a major component of crude oil for the United States. It's one reason why everybody was not very happy about the moratorium last year is because that was cutting our own throats from relative to supply. Uh, Five billion barrels of new reserves with rising prices. You now have a vibrant Gulf of Mexico going forward. But one thing that is really tough on the Gulf of Mexico is everything is advanced, planned. I'm talking two, three, five, ten years. You don't just go decide you're going to drill a well. You might have equipment and, and platforms that you may have to have identified two, three, four years in advance. I don't know how many, plat how many drilling rigs we lost in the Gulf. I want to say four or five rigs in the Gulf left the Gulf of Mexico to go drill overseas somewhere because of the moratorium. And those contracts are generally three, four, six-year contracts. So you take away one rig, all of a sudden we've lost how much reserves relative to that rig's activity. It's going to show up in the numbers sometime in the next 24 months about those rigs leaving the Gulf. As far as gas goes, uh, we have about 6 billion cubic feet of gas above 1,000 feet, which means on the shelf, and we have total reserves of about 12 billion cubic feet of gas, but that number about seven years ago was double that. So we've had a big drop off in the amount of gas reserves in the Gulf of Mexico. Again, it's a relative to price and recovery and cost, and as oil prices rose, what are you looking for? I'm looking more for oil than I am gas. So there's probably a lot of gas prospects in the Gulf that were not drilled over the last seven or eight years because oil was a favored commodity price. But 4.3% of U.S. reserves come from gas in the Gulf of Mexico, so more oil focus in the Gulf provides our needs than gas. And obviously after today, if you haven't figured it out, we got tons of gas in the shale plays onshore, but it doesn't mean in the Gulf is not going to be economically viable. It's just not going to be a percentage-wise a big part of the uh, overall consumption. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico, production from the Gulf, you can see the numbers are big, they're huge. It's, a, it's one of the richest oil basins in the world. It's got just tremendous geology. When you think about it, you've got South America, you've got North America, you're dumping all this into this basin, and I, I tell everybody, I say, it's the largest toilet in the planet, because essentially all these tributaries and all these faults have ended up dumping all this organic material in the Gulf of Mexico. You have this nice tectonic movement. We've created this nice basin and bowl, and that's where all the dead animals and plants and hydrocarbons were trapped millions of years ago. 
So now we've got to go drill in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can you imagine what's really out there in the middle if we could ever get deep enough to it. Oil represents 29.9% of proved reserves uh, coming from the Gulf of Mexico, and gas represents 10.7%. I've kind of beat a dead horse, but I'm just letting you know it's a substantial number when you talk about how much oil is in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, in the last seven years, oil reserves have dropped 18%. Okay? In the last seven years, gas reserves have dropped 46%. So from, a, from an initial broad blush view of the Gulf, you say, man, this thing is in a, in a decline. Kind of like West Texas, when uh, I guess Barbara was talking about West Texas, she's seen four rodeos in West Texas, and it's alive and vibrant again. I think the Gulf of Mexico is in the same boat. It goes from looking like we're in a decline to all of a sudden resurgence of success, and most of that's going to be predicated on commodity prices and technology. The more technology, the higher the price, the more we're going to find. Risk to reward, you know, gas dropped by 50 to 60 percent in commodity prices uh, over the last, what, three years, four years. So there's been a, a real economic setback from the standpoint I'm not going to go find gas, especially uh, if it's going to cost me so much to find it. And I've got a, a, a dry hole probability in the Gulf of Mexico because it's conventional drilling, not shale drilling. Uh, we've seen oil rise by 300 percent or more in commodity prices. I mean, we've been as high as 145, down to 32, back up to 114. But at the end of the day, oil prices have by far outstripped, which means that outstripped uh, gas prices. So what it means is we're looking at a Gulf of Mexico that's vibrant in oil, has a lot of prospects, and that seems to be the favored commodity at this point. So the Gulf of Mexico map, what, you know, this map was on the other PowerPoint presentation, but when you look out here, you've got all these pipelines and all these infrastructure and platforms, all the logistical collection points of processing plants, transportation plants, amine plants, uh, it's just it's this massive spider web of activity, and it's all to serve one thing. Get all that oil and gas production offshore, back to shore, and figure out how to get it processed, refined, into its final market or destination place. So if you can think about when you're flying over the Gulf, if you get an opportunity to do that, uh, you'll have some views out there, and you can see these platforms. But there's this whole web underneath the water of pipelines and infrastructure that exist that are helping to service those platforms, which in fact are producing millions of barrels of oil a day, and and uh, you know, tons of BCF of gas. How does the Gulf of Mexico work and how did it get laid out? Again, I said it's, it's very much like the, uh, the Bakken. It's basically cut up in squares. It's done in lease blocks. Uh, you go through a bidding process and you may end up buying a particular lease because you win it in the bid. And at the end of the day, you know what your block is. They're on five, 10 uh, year leases. And you just have to figure out geologically where you think the oil and gas is and you lease it and you go spend a couple hundred million dollars to look for oil and gas. It's a pretty simple process. Continental Shelf Boundary, this came right off of the, uh, the uh, Gulf of Mexico website, and what it does, it kind of clearly defines what you're looking at as far as the playground. Everything in the red indicates the water, everything in the light shaded area is of course onshore Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas. And as you can see, it's, it's a relative cookie cutter pattern. Um, and at any given point in time, you can have all kinds of activity, drilling and leasing and production. But this is the, the Gulf of Mexico as, as geologists and pipeline companies see it as opportunity in the playground they're going to they're be involved in. Active leases are secured by major oil companies, oil and gas companies. And I can tell you with what happened last year with the BP Macondo, I'm not sure of all the new regulations, but you've got to be a deep, deep pocketed company to even think about playing in the Gulf of Mexico. Even normal players, and I know a few, like uh, Hall Houston, are really looking at it and saying, wow, the, the ante to play in the Gulf as far as the bond and the financial uh, backing has just been double, triple, quadruple. So the only people, or the only companies that are going to be playing in the Gulf of Mexico have got to be the super majors. It's going to be big boys because of the cost of drilling, but also the financial requirement, all thanks to the BP spill last year. So we know one thing, at least the companies that are in the Gulf are, are the biggest and best players in the world with regard to uh, oil companies and exploration companies. This is showing the active leases that are in the Gulf. Now, you may recall a while ago that we actually had the boundary all the way down here, you know, below the, uh, the tip of the peninsula of, of uh, uh, Florida. But if you notice, most of the leases are hugging where? They're hugging the coastline because that's shallow water and it's easy to get your pipelines back to shore. Uh, a lot of the production is up here, mostly between like the Mississippi River and back over here toward the Texas line. And it's just amazing how it's all been clustered. I'm assuming that's because of infrastructure, success in geology. Louisiana is a very, very well-heeled state when it comes to oil and gas reserves, and that reserves carries from shoreline out into the water. So what is the game changer as far as the Gulf of Mexico goes? Now, everybody's got their own opinion, but in my, my world the last couple of years, the game changer for the Gulf has been some successful discoveries made by uh, Mac Moran. And Mac Moran uh, has a presentation on their website, and I've taken some of their slides off their website because I didn't know how to 
cut and paste, but quite frankly, they did a great job. So I will tell you, this is a Mac Moran PowerPoint. You can look up. But essentially what has happened is, is that, um, and uh, Diane, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think the week that we got our, our uh, exclusive agreement signed with Tennessee, a couple days before we got our exclusive agreement signed, Mac Moran comes out on a Monday and announces that they think they made the largest gas discovery in the last 25 or 40 years in the Gulf of Mexico called the Davy Jones. It was drilled to roughly 28 or 29,000 feet deep. They reported that they had two to 300 foot of pay in what's known as the Wilcox Formation. They were claiming it might be two to three trillion cubic feet of gas. And as it would turn out, I think Diane might have called me late on Monday. She said, hey, guess what? Have you seen the Mac Moran uh, uh, discovery? I said, no. Well, it's right underneath our, one of our five pipelines that we're trying to buy. My first thought is, well, Tennessee is going to pull. They're going to pull that pipeline. It's going to make a ton of money. We're not going to get that one of five systems. But Tennessee stuck to their word, gave us the exclusive agreement. We had the right to buy five systems. They included the system that ran literally on top of the Davy Jones discovery. Well, what does the Davy Jones discovery really mean? Let's see if I can give you just an example. I'm not going to make you into geologists, but what this is, is this is a well log. The, the white section in the middle is actually a, uh, the well bore itself as it was drilled down to roughly 28,500 feet. And what you have is you have a log signature that indicates potential hydrocarbon bearing sand. So all these little squiggly lines on the left and right side, where you see these little sun markers, it represents what they consider to be productive pay zones. And you dream of having a log like this. I don't care if you're in the water or on shore, but you dream of having a, a well that has that much pay behind pipe. And effectively what they are, are claiming and showing, and they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars based on the success of this well, that they think the well is loaded with Wilcox pay sands. They think they've got Tuscaloosa and other carbonates that are productive. And from the standpoint of what that, that initial discovery well means to an oil company is that if, in fact, I have all these sands that are productive, how big is the reservoir? How far does it go? What's, what's the aerial extent of that particular fault system? Because if it's as big as they think it is, it could be two to three trillion cubic feet of gas. It's, it's massive in size. What I find most important, though, is that they've established production in a reservoir that really had not been established in, in this particular sequence of sands in the shallow water in the Gulf. So now, put it in a little bit more macro thought, and this is where my brain is always going when I'm looking at our pipelines. If McMoran made this discovery, that means that there now are, are a good chance there's other Wilcox structures within the shallow water that are owned by other companies that would like to go explore and test them. If this well produces like they believe it will produce, uh, you can see a whole new setting off of drilling at this particular depth in this interval because it's not going to be just one Wilcox well. There's going to be a whole sequence of Wilcox wells. So this is a very pivotal well for the Gulf. Uh, I believe they're scheduled, according to their website, they're scheduled to test it in December. And if we get a good test, which means they're going to go and flow the well and see what it's capable of doing, if it flows the capacity, it's going to be a monster well with a lot of gas, and effectively that's going to set off what I believe is going to be a nice field development. Okay? The way they've structured it is, as I showed you the map, it's right up here along the uh, Louisiana coastline. This is what they believe the structure is. Uh, McMoran drilled a second confirmation well. And all I'm doing by pointing out the slides is that uh, I believe McMoran has roughly, I want to say $400 million invested in these first two wells. It's a lot of money on two wells just to prove your concept. So they have a lot of confidence it's going to work. And what we are looking at is the opportunity to say, as pipe, potential pipeline owners in the Gulf, we're looking for more gas. We need volume. We need liquids. We need volume. We want producers out there drilling wells and putting them online so we can fill up our pipelines we're about to buy. But more importantly is, is that the Gulf of Mexico as a whole if this discovery works out like Mac Moran believes, it's going to set off a whole new resurgence of exploration, which could see the Gulf of Mexico go back to an incline, just like West Texas and the Eagleford, which wasn't even around two years ago. Okay. I know you can't really tell what this means, but each one of these little symbols is a rig which represents activity from some of the Mac Moran wells that have been drilled. They've tested several wells within the Gulf of Mexico. A uh, few of them are offshore as far as their prospect ideas. I say offshore, they're off the shelf. The other wells have been drilled up on the shelf. And when you look at the, the amount of uh, aerial capacity, so this little blue line represents one area they believe might be a Wilcox Tuscaloosa sand. So how many leases do you think are going to be inside of this particular area when you look at that cutter board? If that Wilcox is productive, you could be talking about multiple number of prospects from different operators. So it's very encouraging. But each one of these colored areas represents a potential size or boundaries of a reservoir that they're going to drill. Um, if I'm going to be in the Gulf of Mexico, or I believe the Gulf of Mexico has financial opportunity, whether it be in exploration or it be in pipeline or midstream, it looks very promising to say, 
I've got a lot of massive or very large discoveries, which is a good indication that we have a, a revitalized gulf taking place right before our eyes. Oh, are there only massive discoveries warranted completion? So the point is, is that when you have a big discovery, uh, I learned this the hard way about six years ago drilling a well with Devon Energy. We drilled an 18,000 foot directional well in Galveston County and for a month and a half, and I think I told you guys this story, hopefully I don't tell you, say it twice, we're sitting there watching this well drill for a month or two and all I hear is from Devon Energy's engineers and geologists, we're fighting the well, fighting the well, gas flowing, we're, we found what we're looking for, it's a great well, that's all the well reports came out, I'm going, well, I, I hope they're right. Uh, we get out to the logging truck, it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I don't like to really go in the logging truck. I like to sit on the back of the truck and say, just stick your hand out and tell me is it good or bad because I don't need to be in there to see the baby born. Just tell me what I got, a boy or a girl. In this case, uh, they came out and they said it wasn't a good well. Well, the difference was is that because Devon Energy looks at dollar allocation, it was a $10 million well to drill, but maybe about 5 or $6 million to complete it. They decided that we'll take our $6 million instead of completing this well, although it has gas, it doesn't have enough gas. So we'll take our $6 million, put another four with it, and drill another brand new prospect that might be monstrous in size. Gulf of Mexico is the same way. Uh, there is a publicly traded company called ATP that has done very, very well for themselves. ATP, I, I'm not, their stock has not been very vibrant, but the company is well run, and they're outstanding offshore producers. But ATP, I met Mr. Buhlman back in uh, 1995 when he was going in and looking for little bitty wells that the majors thought were not economic. He's buying these little proved offset wells and drilling them. And, He's turned his company into a very successful oil and gas company. It's publicly traded. You can look up. But it goes to my point, which is big companies need big reserves to spend completion dollars. The Davy Jones requires some very, very specialized equipment. And I don't know all the details about what the equipment has to do. What I know is they've been building it for about, I want to say, almost 18 to 24, no, about 18 months. They've been building this equipment. It's very hot temperature gas. It's got a lot of pressure. And so they've been out focusing on building these special design equipment, production platform, and all the equipment that's necessary to make this well a commercial well. So the big rodeo or the big presentation is supposed to be in December when they have all this equipment finished, they install it, and they actually flow test the well. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've got them under contract to, to transport and carry their gas when they first come online. It's actually on their PowerPoint, so I think I can say that correctly, because this was, this was on their website showing they're going to connect to a subsea tie-in with Tennessee Gas, which is the pipeline that we're in the process of, of acquiring. So from the standpoint of, of, of having good luck or good fortune, it was good luck and good fortune that we had uh, our pipeline directly sitting next to the Davy Jones. It was also good luck and good fortune that our team and our partners were able to go and negotiate and beat out several other pipeline companies to get that contract to carry that gas, because our, our cost basis is virtually nil to hook up this gas. So, it's very fortunate, but again, it goes back to what I'm saying. The Gulf of Mexico appears to be taking a turn, in my opinion, back to a revitalized basin. Multiple new fields and new discoveries are reviving the Gulf of Mexico. This is an example of some additional McMoran wells. Uh, they're talking about drilling down into the Tuscaloosa. The Blackbeard well, I believe, tested at 21 million a day in gas, but I'm not sure what the reserves are, but they're, they're substantial. And again, look at the pay zone they have behind pipe. This is a totally separate prospect in another part of the Gulf. But again, it's going to lead to geological discoveries. It's going to set off a whole bunch of drilling. Um, and again, it's large reserves, so they're not out there just playing with little small stuff. It's so again, uh, some additional Miocene, which I love Miocene zones. They just produce like racehorses. Uh, so I love the way they look. All in all, and oh, this is the seismic, I'm sorry. They're all doing it off 3D seismic. So what you see is these nice little pods or these structural uh, rises in here, which indicate that they've got some really large structures and features. So they're measuring the size of their reservoir based on seismic interpretations, well logs, and doing all their calculations. But apparently they're pretty convinced, and it looks very convincing to everybody that's involved, and there's a lot of uh, bated breath and waiting in the eyes to see how this well turns out. This is another deep prospect they have. They have not drilled it yet, but they've got uh, quite a few prospects and ideas. But they essentially are looking at 30 trillion cubic feet of gas, maybe 14 TCF net, which means net to their interest. That's a lot of gas being discovered in the Gulf of Mexico as a result of this exploration activity. If they're even half right, it's adding tremendous amount of reserves. And we're not talking about just doubling or tripling. It's going to make a substantial difference in the Gulf of Mexico when it comes to gas. What I also like is if you look at their prospect spread, look how it spreads out and covers quite a bit of area. So just because McMoran has one of these prospects doesn't mean that 10 other oil companies, major players like Exxon or Shell or, or any one of the big players in the Gulf, they don't have the same kind of ideas and, and information as far as prospects. And that's why I say the Gulf of Mexico could literally be back on that swing again. And I believe it is based on what Mac Brown is clearly demonstrating. Everybody else is kind of more tight-lipped. I think Mac Brown wants to tell the world so their stock prices stay high. 
and they can make sure that their shareholders are happy. The future is very bright for exploration of midstream players in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, again, gas production, offshore fields. It's nice to see all this gas out here loaded in with the Mac Moran and the other discoveries. We expect to see uh, additional uh, fields and, and new production brought online. And uh, I think as gas prices, again, stay kind of fairly consistent, it's going to take big reserves to make anyone drill a gas well, but uh, obviously they're pretty happy with it. Um, this will be for tomorrow. What I wanted to tell you about the Gulf of Mexico is that um, I am not the expert by any stretch of the imagination. I know as little as, as probably most of you do in this room. What I do know is that we have a great team with our company, which is Kinetic and Midstream. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have the opportunity to even uh, try to acquire the pipeline system from Tennessee Gas. We are looking at other opportunities in and around the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, when you're looking at buying assets and you're looking at buying pipelines, like we're doing in the shale, what you want to find is a good economic model that makes money today at today's prices, but you need to have growth, and that growth is going to come from activity. So I was going to set the tone a little bit for our uh, pipeline meeting tomorrow with our partners, the folks that are invested in the uh, FSH midstream and are involved in the Connecticut pipeline. But, you know, when you look at the Gulf, it's always been a great basin. It looks like it's going to continue to be a great basin. And I think we've had a temporary setback because of the uh, BP Macondo spill. But at the end of the day, I think there's not much of a choice. We're going to need to develop the Gulf of Mexico relative to uh, expected production. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what the shale plays really mean for the future of exploration. Now, how many of you been, have been involved in oil and gas drilling longer than 15 years? Raise your hand. You've been involved in any kind of wells? 25 years. Bruce, I think you bought a well when you were born. <laughs> when you used to drill wells in uh, conventional drilling, you would drill a well, and you could always hear from the, the tool pusher or the driller, Man, it's going to be a tough well to drill because we've got to cut through shale, and I hate that shale. It's sloughs, it's popping off rock, it's got gas, can't use it, it's not commercial, it's blah, blah, blah. So shale up until about, really about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, was, you didn't want it. I mean, it, was, it cost you more to drill through it, and you really couldn't make any money out of it. So it was a nightmare, and you had to consider, do you want to drill this well because of the shale? Well, lo and behold, you know, all these companies that were drilling through these shale years and years and years ago, all these different fields that we're finding now, were found by old vertical wells drilled conventionally. And so uh, Barbara, when she comes up and does her presentation, is going to give everyone a little history and background. I'm not going to steal her thunder, but she's going to tell you a little bit about how this shale evolution occurred. And what I will tell you is everything in life is about money. <laughs> so Dr. Gandolfo uh, may have a slight contrarian view to that, but it's about money. I personally believe we would solve cancer if there was more money in the cure than, than in the medicines and the doctors and everything else. I think anything we want to do, we could solve if we had enough money motivated in it, correct? That's what happened to shale. The United States was in a decline. Oil and gas companies are drilling wells. Our success ratio was falling like a rock. I mean, in 1997, that year, we had 85% of the wells we drilled were successful off of 3D seismic. By 2003, I think we had 18 dry holes in a row. Some of you were in those dry holes. I mean, we couldn't find oil in a jiffy lube because it was so, it was so dad burn risky. The cost of wells that in 1997 cost 1.2 million to drill were costing two and a half, three, four million dollars to drill. So prices escalated, success was coming down. We're like a bunch of rats on a treadmill, running, 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 and we were watching our production output in the United States continue to fall. If you ever pull up the Energy Information Agency, EIA, and look at the, the statistics, it's pretty staggering. And so what I want to do is tell you about what I think shale has done. Uh, I'm more excited, I know I get excited about everything, but I am really more excited today than I've ever been about the energy business, and not just drilling, but pipelines and assets and leases and infrastructure and service companies, and here's why. I see the oil and gas business the way it probably was back before I was born in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, when everything was, grass was green, all the Easter eggs were out in the pasture, it's Easter morning, it's 8 o'clock, and boy, it's whatever you want, Katie, bar the door. However much risk you can take and how much money you can find, it's carte blanche. That's really what's happening in the shale place. And I'm going I'm to pass this around later, but I want you to actually stop and look at this map. I tried to find a digital version. I couldn't. But I had this map, and I'll hold it up. I had this map from almost uh, 12 years ago. And it's a map that said, United States Fracture Shell Resource Map. Now, I know some of you in the back can't see it, but we have basically the Barnett Shale, a little bitty dot. We've got the uh, Anadarko Basin, and we have the Nibrer, which is about this big. 
Uh, you don't see Haynesville. You don't see Eagleford. You don't see Marcellus. You really don't see any of the major plays that are here today. This map's only uh, 2,000, so 11, almost 12 years old. Staggering. Now watch the maps that I'm fixing to put up on the screen, and uh, I think you'll see that what we're talking about is the United States has solved this natural gas problem, solved it from the standpoint we have tons that we've discovered, which I think is going to keep prices down. We're finding more shells that have high liquids and oil in it, but you know, what I'm going to tell you is, is that this is a, a, a grand venture that we've got 20, 30 years to run in, and you can participate however you want, stocks, uh, direct participation. Thank you for being patient. Gave me a chance to take my own one or two breaths for the whole presentation. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk to you about what I think is going on in the shale plays, and hopefully everybody gets some value out of it from the standpoint of whatever your view is about investing in energy and however you're doing it, this is going to make a big difference. There we go. There we go. Okay, so the map I held up a while ago essentially at that time had maybe three or four shale plays. And those shell plays were very much in their infancy with regard to technology, fracking, drilling, completion, equipment, the types of materials that were used. What you see now is this is called North American shell plays. And what we're looking at is literally, in my opinion, 25 to 35 percent of the country has shale gas, shale oil underneath it. Now, you didn't have that map 11 years ago. And if you wonder why natural gas prices continue to stay suppressed, it's because we found what the, uh, the pundits will say and what the experts will say, we went from about a seven year supply of natural gas to what they now estimate a hundred years of supply of natural gas based on the shales. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, I gotta get this in. Um, one of the key factors is always gonna be price. Um, I don't know what the actual statistics are on every single shell play, but what I can tell you is a good portion of these shell plays become very uneconomic very quick. If gas prices were to drop down in the low threes or high two dollars per MCF, a significant number of these shale plays are no longer economic. It, the margins are very, very thin. Okay? The same holds true for higher prices. If we have gas prices go up to 525, 550, what you're going to see is a flood of wells on these fields come online. Because you don't really drill dry holes in shale. I mean, it's a blanket sand. Unless you're out on the fringes, you're going to make a well every time. It's a matter of volume, recovery of cost. So, what you have is a huge inventory of shale plays, massive infrastructure worth of pipelines and, and uh, locations, just thousands upon millions of acres of leases, but what you don't have is you, do, you don't have the control over the price or the commodity. So drilling goes up, gas prices come down, they stop drilling. Right under your feet is the Barnett Shale. Now how many of you have ever been in a Barnett Shale well? Let me see any hands. Anybody? Bruce again. Munson's again. Okay. The Barnett Shale back in the, in the 90s was the first real commercial uh, shale that somebody had, had actually discovered and was making commercial use of. And it went from my geologist, who I used for 10 years, telling me, that shale deal, that's the biggest joke I've ever seen. It's uneconomic. He doesn't work for me very long, because about two years later I let him go. After uh, they discovered the Barnett, and they, they effectively said, you can make a lot of money out of shale plays. And I think, I'm going to say there's like seven or 8,000 wells drilled in the Barnett Shale right now. From, it wasn't very good 12 years ago to thousands of wells drilled. The reason why the Barnett, you don't see 100 rigs around us right now like you would South Texas or up in North Dakota or up in the Marcellus or in different areas of the state is because it's primarily gas. It's primarily dry gas. There's not a lot of liquids with it. So what you're talking about is drilling a two to four million dollar well with gas prices at $3.95 to $4 and that's pretty tight economics. So you don't see a lot of rigs. But we're sitting on just a massive amount of gas right underneath our feet and it covers about seven counties. So when you look at the price, this is from the EIA, they're telling us, look, oil prices could be as high as 200 by 2035, or it could be down in the 50s. Well, I'm okay with that. I mean, if you're telling me my downside is maybe 50, and of course they're just doing projections, but if you're telling me my range is 50 to 200, well, at some point, go look at this chart on the wall. It says value gain from uh, price uplift. If your fundamental cost of a well is in place, then really all commodity prices do is either give you a negative effect on your economics or it helps you increase. So that's what these shale plays are doing. We're, we're perfecting the techniques. We're making better wells. We're applying better drilling methods with horizontal, but at the end of the day, it's all about what the price is to get out that barrel of oil or that MCF of gas and how it makes economic sense. So commodity prices, they're always driving the technology, right? So you gotta have supply, you gotta have demand. You're not gonna need the supply if you don't have the demand. Well, I don't see anybody in that parking lot with any smaller vehicle than they had last week. Uh, when I drive down 75 coming to work every morning, 
uh, Ryan that rides with me, we were laughing the other day. I said, let's count how many uh, SUVs are on, on 75 this morning, see how many big trucks are out there. He goes, it'd be easier to count the cars. So we're not really, uh, we obviously don't see enough pain at $3.60 for gasoline. We don't really see a reason to cut back, which means that supply is going to be catching up to demand on a continual basis. Commodity prices, obviously when I say commodity price, meaning it drives everything, cost of drilling and, and the price of recovery. Technology. I don't know if most of you are aware of this or not, but statistically, the oil and gas industry is the largest consumer of software and hardware of any industry in the world. Okay, I heard a statistic two weeks ago that said for every dollar spent in oil and gas or energy, $47 are created in additional jobs downstream. Workers, employees, all the way down through the system. So it's not only a vibrant business, but it, it has the ability for technology to continue to advance it. And I think by the time we're done with the presentation, this industry is alive and well and will be well for a long time. And I think personally, regardless of how low prices go, we have to have it, we're going to find it, we'll just have to pay for it. Uh, access, meaning, you know, there's a lot of areas in this country that have a lot of oil and gas, we're not going to ever be able to put a drill bit in it. You know, so it's like uh, Rhonda was saying earlier, is about water. You know, there's a lot of places that have water, but because of the environmentalists and everything else, we may not get to get it. It, it kind of was a, a shocker when you sit here and listen to the water presentation, he says, snail darters and the blind salamander and the rice and we'll have to figure out how to get our water back from this blind salamander. <laughs> that's how we're going to get it back. If that's the case, well, at the same time, access. When we run out of fuel and we need to run this country, we will be in those areas that have oil and gas. I can assure you that. Uh, risk versus reward. It's all about life. It's, it's, it's called investments. If we don't have enough reward, we're not taking the risk. That's why there's trillions of dollars in cash sitting in y'all's bank accounts because you can't find something you're comfortable with to move out of cash because you're too concerned about all the risk. So it's going to stay there until somebody convinces you differently. Well, this is just a chart that I, I created about three or four years ago, but I find it very interesting. And uh, basically what you're seeing is, is that this is the amount of crude oil production in the state of Texas relative to the number of rigs that were or a number of producing wells. And what you'll notice is, is that we continually see a massive increase in the number of rigs, which is the white, uh, number of wells, which is the, excuse me, we continue to see an increase in the number of wells, which is the white line, but we see a massive decrease in the output, which is the yellow line. So when you can have a double or triple increase in the number of wells, but you're on a sharp decline uh, with the yellow line, what that's telling you is what? We're finding smaller reserves. It's taken five times as many wells to get it out. They're not lasting near as long. And like rats in a treadmill, we're watching our production output drop like a rock. Same thing happens in gas. In gas, same thing. We're looking at massive number of increases in wells, and the gas production onshore was continuing to drop like a rock. Now, this is all about five years ago, but with the shale and with what's been happening in these shale plays, the gas has turned around massively. Now, there's still going to be a ton of wells. I mean, we're drilling wells out in West Texas like a, like a pin cushion. We're drilling wells South Texas like a pin cushion. But effectively, we have these big gas wells coming in, and they're declining like a, like a steep decline curve, real, real sharp. So we will find a lot of gas in only shell plays, but we, we can almost actuarially look out in the future and say, you know, at some point in time, we'll have this stable production rate, but initially it's going to have some massive declines. That's factored into the, uh, the economics. So shale today, where are we? Well, this is always subjective because you talk to 20 people in the business, they all have a different opinion about shale. Which ones work? Which is better? Is the Eagleford better? Is the Woodford better? Is the Marcellus? How about the Permian Basin? Well, my background is economics and finance. I don't care where I get the shale from. I just want to make the most money for my effort, right? So I don't care if I drilled a well out in this parking lot. If it's a good well, low risk, make a lot of money, I don't care where it's located. But there are statistical advantages in each one of these shale plays. Some are higher in liquids. Some are higher in volumes initially. Some cost less because they're shallower. Some cost a lot more because they're deeper. You can go East Texas and drill the Haynesville. Well, that's a 11,000 foot well that costs eight to $10 million to drill. You can drill right here in the Barnett Shale. I got cash called last week for two horizontal wells. The total cost was $2.3 million. So there's a big difference. Today, what's happened in the shale is that we've had a radical amount of improvements. Uh, that, oops, sorry. At the bottom of the page, it shows you, and I don't think many of you can see it, but I'll just tell you, what they've done in the industry, they being the engineers, the geologists, the geophysicists, the real brain power behind the shale, is that they've been able to increase the time to drill. They've been able to decrease it by 45%. The number of rigs uh, running and the wells per year per rig has gone up 83%. Well, it's obvious. The faster you drill, the better you drill, the more wells you get to drill with the same rig. They've got uh, longer laterals, meaning longer horizontal legs, which exposes the drill bit and the well board to more reservoir. More reservoir means the more recovery of, of reserves that you get out. And it goes on and on and on. At the end of the day, what it really boils down to is that uh, the oil and gas industry is a very efficient machine. I know that most people in the public who are not really involved in energy 
we're the bad guys. I told somebody last night at dinner, I said, I think we've been blamed for Jimmy Hoffa and a couple other things. I mean, the only gas is always is the whipping child. And they never realize that what, what it really takes to find us. I mean, billions are spent to find fields but long before they ever get them discovered. And the reality is, is that we lose a lot of money in dry holes and uneconomic wells trying to find fields like these shale plays, but that's effectively why we're rewarded so handsomely. And we don't set the price, by the way, as most of you know. It's set by traders, the commodity, and supply and demand. So I don't know if any of you who become wealthy or have your own money, if you own a store and they walk in and go, you know, I bought that uh, suitcase for only $3 and I'm selling it for $150. I'm making too much, so I'm not going to take the $150. No, you're probably thinking, I sold it for $150, you bought it right off the bat, I should have charged $250. So we're all economists and we're all entrepreneurs by heart. One of the biggest uh, components of shale plays is, is actually the drilling technique, the horizontal drilling. And I'm going to give you just a, just a small example. All right? When you drill a vertical well, you only have essentially a 7.5 inch well bore that's connected to your reservoir. So no matter how much I try to force water and sand and shale, or excuse me, chemicals down in the well bore, I'm only going to get a certain penetration out of that well bore to create artificial fractures. So what was happening is we were drilling shell wells, fracking them. We were getting much better results from a vertical well than we've ever had before, which was encouraging. But now if you think about it, and it, it is an uh, exponential factor, they say, you know what? This carpet in this room is all shale underneath your feet. Let's assume each one of your rows is an actual horizontal well bore. I stand on one of these little circles beneath your feet. Let's say that's a 7-inch well bore. I may get out as far as the little tentacles off your little circle here, right, with the frack. Now, all of a sudden, if you look at this center aisle, for those of you who are on it, I drill a horizontal well along this path, and every one of these little circles represents a fracture point or a penetration point along that wellbore path. I've got the equivalent of maybe 20 or 30 wells in a single wellbore. So it wasn't drilling one horizontal well over 640 acres means I've got two or three wells. It was a factor of 10 or 20 fold. That in itself caused the economics to change. So I go from drilling a $1.5 million vertical well, now I drill a $4 million horizontal, but I'm getting 20 times the reserves and longevity and exposure. The drilling technique was the biggest answer. The frack techniques helped, and that started it, but really the horizontal drilling, I think, is what's made the difference, because you would not go frack wells with all this great frack sand I have up here if you drilled it vertically. Okay? This is what frack sand is all about. How many of you invested in carbo ceramics like I recommended a couple of years ago? Anybody? Okay, it's still rocking, and, and I don't think it's going to go anywhere. I'm, I'm looking for a stock split, hopefully, but it's CRR, carbo ceramics, and at the time, we were being held back eight or six you know, months, whatever it was, for a frack job because we couldn't find this carbo-ceramic uh, propent that we needed for fracking our wells. So I got online, started looking around, and said, well, who supplies this stuff? Well, right here in Dallas is carbo-ceramics. I think the stock was at $28 a share when I made the recommendation. I think it's like $146 now. It's done it in two years. The company basically has designed all types of frack sand. So I don't know if you can see it or not, but this frack sand is resin-coated. So it becomes sticky when it gets hot. And so what you're trying to do is maybe have these sand granules stick to the reservoir. They become like a propping inside the reservoir, and they keep the fractures open for a longer period of time. So these engineers, depending on the lithology and the composition of the rock, they decide, shell play by shell play, what do they really need to have inside that well with regard to the type of sand. This is a 2040 sand we fracked the well about 10 years ago in the Bossier. And you say, well, it's pretty colors. Well, it's not that they're colored. Every sand granule has something treated on it. And so what they're doing is they're, they're figuring out what size, shape, composition, chemicals they add to the sand, which re give the best positive response in the reservoir. Well, companies like Carbo Ceramics, that's what they do for a living. They design fracks. They spend millions of dollars on research to figure out what zones work. And these bright guys have figured it out. And so they're just taking more and more advanced technology, and they're opening up these uh, shale plays. Have we solved our natural gas problem? And I'll try to keep the pace because I know Barbara's got uh, her presentation. But have we solved our natural gas problem? I've been saying this for almost three years. At every workshop I've done and every trade show, we have solved the natural gas problem. And I, and I tell you why. Um, there are numbers, hundreds of wells drilled in the Haynesville, Bossier, and other areas that are literally sitting there capped. Been drilled, sitting there capped. Because why? The price was not economic. Uh, the price for natural gas dropped as low as, I think, 235 on MCF back in uh, February of 2009. The price sensitivity is pretty, pretty tight. And so between the shale plays, the new reservoir trend, the new reserves and reservoir trends, horizontal drilling and completion techniques, we've got more gas than we're going to need for, like I said, 100 years. Uh, it's a good thing. We need good clean fuel. But if you're playing the natural gas drilling game, you know your upside's pretty limited. Uh, we've got some experts back here. Steve Lloyd's back here with Laser. They trade in gas. We've got Carl Beach and Rodney Wren, our new president of, of Hammock Pipeline. They all trade in gas and understand it. But what I can tell you is, Run that $5 in 25, $5.50 range, there's a whole series of wells that will come online 
and flood the market. So you might get a bump in natural gas. I think it's going to be short-lived. That's just my personal opinion. Here's, here's some of the data. We've got excess supply, lots of shell plays, lots of technology. The new economics are very thin margins. Uh, you need liquid rich gas. So if you're in an area that has a lot of good high BTU, meaning 1,000 BTUs is what you, you burn at your burner, if it's 1,250 BTU gas, it means you have a lot of, of gas liquids that come with that dry gas, which means you can increase the value of that net MCF. So you might say, well, gas is low. Why are you drilling this well? Well, we're getting maybe 10 barrels of condensate. Maybe we're getting uh, 250 BTUs worth of liquid. So our net net gain is 550 in MCF. So it's a, it's a pretty good play. Uh, Long-term solutions, uh, from an eight-year supply to now a 100-year supply. That happened in the last five or six years. I mean, if you go to the EIA website, where most of this data comes from, they're telling you that in, in the last decade, we have increased our, our capacity for gas supply by an exponential, you know, 12-factor. Commodity prices, artificial ceiling, expected low. Um, for me, anything we do in gas, I'm going to use around 325 in MCF because we're going to have bumps high and bumps low. I, I can always see gas at certain periods of time of the year drop below $3. It will not stay there long, but that's where it's going to be. Okay, this is just the chart that supports that. All they're doing is talking about how, how we've just really solved the problem in, in uh, the last decade, and it's astronomical how much gas. And this doesn't even count really the offshore gas discoveries that are being made either, because the Gulf of Mexico, which we're doing later today, it would be pretty staggering some of the things that are happening in the Gulf of Mexico to combine with the shales. Okay, proved reserves. When you look at 08 to 09, you see that we jumped from reserves of 34 billion, or excuse me, yeah, billion cubic feet of gas to 60 by 09. We almost doubled our reserves in a year. Anybody think gas is going up anytime soon? I don't. So effectively, we've done a great job with gas. And this is the major uh, gas fields in the lower 48 states. So this map up on the screen is a whole lot different than the map I showed you at the beginning. We don't have any of that red on this map. You see nothing up here and very little in this area. So what we have done is we have used this technology to really open up domestic exploration for natural gas, and it's exciting. I mean, don't, don't worry about having too much gas. It's good for us, the consumer. We just need to figure out how to use more of it to reduce our dependency on oil after we finish our Bakken drilling. <clears throat> U.S. gas shale production, if you'll notice, these are this interesting, but each one of these shale plays continue to increase in volume and capacity. One thing that I found interesting in these charts is that you notice the Barnett shale rocketed because it was the first one, right? And now look at it, it's actually showing flat, and in some cases it actually have a downward decline curve on the Barnett because it's such dry gas. It's just not as exciting and just not as good economic return. But let me tell you something. I talked to an engineer about four months ago who's very, very well respected, has been involved in almost all these shell plays, and I said, so what do you think about the two best shell plays in the country in your opinion? He said, first one, I like the Bakken because it's got so much oil and they recover reserves, so which is part of the reason I'm in the Bakken. The second thing he said is the Barnett shell underneath your feet. You're sitting on easy to find gas, infrastructure's in place, landowners have not had their land leased in three or four years, there's not a lot of activity, so you're gonna get great economics, you're gonna get better terms, cheaper drilling. He thinks the Barnett's the great, the great place to put your infrastructure and, and start developing it. Based on this curve, I would say that's probably true, because a lot of these gas plays are very expensive to get into. Clean energy, obviously that's the big pitch. We're all gonna to try to go to natural gas. The more emphasis we have on natural gas, the more we're finding, the more we solve our problem. But each one of these shells plays are continuing to contribute toward that solution. When you look at the overall output in the United States, the, uh, the, the decrease happening in non-OPEC conventional is coming down, estimated by 2035, by what, 8%, 9%? Conventional, unconventional, which is natural gas from shale plays, is going to continue to increase, and it's almost going to double in the next 25 years. I think this chart's way outdated. It was an 09 chart. I think this chart would be, or excuse me, a 10 chart. I think this chart's going to be significantly different based on forecast. So what they're saying is, is that I know from a, a guy that drills wells, when I get a proposal or somebody says, hey, Troy, I want you to drill this conventional well, no thank you. Now, that's, that's kind of hard to say because I have a couple of wells I'm going to have to drill because I like the prospect. But overall, why would I want to drill a conventional well where I've got maybe a 70% chance of success at best, 30% chance of dry, but I can go drill a well in a shell play, and I know that I've got a 95 to 99% chance I'm going to make a commercial producer every time. So it's preservation of capital. So you're going to continue to see the major oil companies focus on shale because of the size of the reserves and the fact they can redeploy that capital time and time and time again. Lower 48 shale plays, all I did was I, it's a little different chart because what it did is it took away the major uh, shale section. But it just shows you when you look at the heart of the country, uh, one thing that I've, I found very interesting is, of course, the Northeast is where we like to sell all of our gas to because they pay a higher price and we got a high population density. 
Well, now with the Marcellus, they've kind of solved their own problem, and it looks like they're heading us off at the pass, heading us, meaning Texas and the reg regular producers. They're finding a lot of gas up in their own backyard, and that's gas they'll supply to themselves. Uh, but when you look at where a real heavy concentration of gas is down here in this quadrant, there's one beautiful state that I love, and uh, we're sitting on an ocean of gas and oil. So, you know, Texas is a great place to be if you're going to be in the energy business. Why have oil and gas liquids taken uh, center stage? Well, the value of the dollar, everything's the price of the dollar. Uh, domestic needs for oil, we continue to consume crude oil. I don't know if you've ever looked at the chart, but really up about three years ago, for the first time, we dropped below 5 million barrels a day in output in the United States uh, onshore. And that dropped to like 4.85 million, so 4,850,000 barrels. Then they brought on the, I think it's Thunder Horse uh, in, the, in the Gulf, Dan. They brought on Thunder Horse and it added like 500,000 barrels a day. So we jumped back over the 5 million uh, barrel a day mark. Uh, with the new oil plays coming on like the Bakken, they're statistically saying we should be around 6.7 million barrels a day. But then in about 20 years, it's going to start that decline again. So again, I, I tell you that from an from a expiration perspective, from a supply perspective, we are drilling like a bunch of rats on a treadmill as fast as we can. There's more rigs active today than there was since five years ago, and we, no way we can keep up. So the good thing is, is the opportunity is great. Um, the uh, well drilling is very low risk, but at the same time, it's all commodity price driven. Uh, we have deliverability without disruption. You know, some of the problems with some of our uh, current shell plates, which we're going to address at our 4 o'clock presentation, is we've got a whole lot of oil and gas coming out of places you didn't think you were going to find oil. The Eagleford, the Permian Basin, the Bakken. Uh, one of the biggest problems with the Bakken is, I don't know what the population in North Dakota is, I think less than 700,000. Well, they're finding all this oil, so what are they doing? They're trying to, they're trying to rail it, truck it, put it in uh, you know, uh, lunch boxes to get oil out of there so they can get it to the market. Effectively, you've got a bottleneck occurring through all these shell plays trying to figure out how to get the gas to market and the oil out of the tanks and downstream. Well, that's a great problem. You say, well, how's it great for an expiration? Well, I've had a lot of dry holes. I'd rather have the problem trying to get my oil to market than saying we're going to pour concrete in this well. So the good thing is we've got a lot of it, and the infrastructure is coming behind us. It's just trailing about 18 to 36 months. Okay? Uh, conventional onshore, it shows that we have 2.37 million barrels of oil per day in 2010 produced from only 30 states. Okay, so only 30 states contributed to onshore production. It's being recovered from thousands of fields. So we're not Saudi Arabia, we're not the Middle East. We, are, we got a bunch of one, two, five, ten barrel a day wells. Uh, it's declining production. When you look at onshore conventional production, it is just like this, steep decline. We've got wells that have been online 8, 10, 15 years. I've got one well that has been online since 1992, still producing. But when you look at the decline curve, it's, it's like a slow death. Everything is coming right to a plug and abandonment. The problem is there are thousands of conventional wells that are hanging on, basically are deemed or considered stripper wells, meaning below two barrels a day. So as a country, we're running around buying big cars, hoping these two barrel a day wells keep us afloat. It's, it's, going, to, it's going to require exactly what's happening now. Conventional uh, drilling has to be replaced by shale, and we've got to figure out better resources, which is what we're doing. Okay, top 100 U.S. oil fields by 2009 improved reserves. Now, you remember the gas map I showed you about five slides ago. It was all over the place, right? Tons and tons of gas. What's the difference in this map? Little bitty baby dots. <laughs> because why? There's a lot more gas than there is oil. So as an oil-consuming nation, what we have is this massive dependency on foreign oil. We're trying to find solutions, but at the end of the day, we're still importing, what is it, 15, 17 million barrels a day. Uh, we have to give billions of dollars weekly to countries that hate our guts, don't want anything prosperous for us at all, and we're selling our souls because we're buying oil that we just don't have in our own country, and we're stuck with it. So the idea, a solution is, is to do what we're doing in the Bakken and in the Eagleford and some of these other places. Find oil in shales where you have massive development opportunities and get to drilling it. So effectively, this is, this is what we're faced with in oil. So if I'm a betting person, do I want to be focused on oil shale or gas shale? You know the answer. So I'm focusing most of my attention on oil shells because I'm going to get paid a lot better. Expected peak of 6 million barrels by 2020. Expected to be at 5.7 million barrels by 2035. So they're expecting us to peak. This is from the Energy Information Agency. They're expecting us to peak at 6 million, which means today we're at 5.35 million. With all these wells that we're drilling, with all the activity in the shell place, we're going to get a whopping 700,000 barrels a day increase between now and 2020, eight years, eight and a half years. But in less than 15 years, we'll drop back down again by over 300,000 barrels. What does that tell you? It tells you that we're, we're doing a great job finding reserves, but if I'm a player and I'm looking at long-term oil reserves, which most of these shell plays, if, if I didn't throw this in a while ago, most of the shell plays are calculated to last 25 to 50 years. 
So you get large, a large flush production from your shale, they'll level off, but we're talking 25 to 40 years. Now, I will tell you this, going back to the well I drilled in 1992 that's still around, I was told by a number of engineers in 1993, 1996, 1999, 2004, oh, that well's only got six months left in it. Well, that's 2012 in about four months and it's still making money. Why is it making money? Because in 1992, gas was about $1.65 in MCF. Gas went to $11, $12, $14 an MCF back in 2001. So the gas price, if you look at it mathematically, we're about 200% higher in gas today uh, for prices than we were in 1992. So I think the shell plays, when, when the, the uh, pundits and the experts are calculating how long these reserves will last, they're not counting on new technology. They're not counting on secondary recovery. They're not counting on additional techniques of extraction. They're not counting on commodity prices. So these shell plays that they're estimating 20 to 40 years could end up lasting 60 to 100 years. Uh, how many of you actually have interest in any wells in East Texas? Where's Ted? Okay, East Texas. 30, 40 years ago, they said the Cotton Valley was going to be drilled on 640-acre space and it might last 15 years. There's wells that have been online for now 40, 50 years, and now they're drilling them on 10-acre spacing. The reserves are so thick and so saturated, they couldn't get it out with a well on 640, and they just kept going down, and now it looks like a pincushion. Well, that 40 years ago, they predicted it wouldn't last 7, 10 years. United States Shell Play. Now, what I've done is I've highlighted or circled the various shale plays that our company, Hammond Cool Company, has had some experience in. So as I started off my presentation this morning, when I look like a little baby, uh, the fact is that we've had a lot of experience in these resource and shale plays. Our company's drilled over 400 oil and gas wells in, in the last 16, 17 years, but we have drilled Barnett shale wells. We have vertically. We've drilled Bossier wells. We have been down in the Eagleford and the Austin Chalk and resource plays. We're in the Alma Sands. Um, the fact is we're in the Permian Basin in two different projects. So the advantage we have is we've had a good assessment economically and mechanically and operationally, what works, what doesn't, what those internal models look like and what the final output is. And so the advantage we have is we continually high grade and improve which areas we believe is the best place to place our fund. One of the things that I've, I've enjoyed is watching the statistical data coming out of all these shell plays. And so some of the things that I find important, and I'm, I'm just a simple knucklehead guy, but there's one key component to these shale plays that I really have enjoyed watching the most, and that's this number right down here, the to total organic carbon. When you look at the carbon content and how much oil and gas is in place per, per meter or per uh, yard of uh, soil or, or, or uh, reservoir, the Bakken by far has the highest saturation of carbon content. So if I'm going to go fishing, I want to fish in a pond loaded with fish. I don't say that the Eagleford, Wolf Camp, Haynesville, these other shale plays don't have a lot of gas and have a lot of oil, but if I'm going to go put a drill bit in the ground, the idea is to find as much economic value as you can for every dollar spent. So our company is involved in uh, the uh, Wolf Camp and the Bakken. We have some pipelines over in the Haynesville area, where we, we, and we have some exposure to uh, Eagleford interest from the standpoint we have some pipelines down there, but we don't actually have any wells that we're drilling in. I personally don't like the Eagleford economics. Uh, that's just my own opinion. I asked that question last night by several people. Are you going to get in the Eagleford? Not me. I don't like the economics. And a blank slide. That means I'm done. I'm just kidding. Okay, so what I was going to do is I'm going to just show you the, the key seven or eight shale plays that are really active because we've got 40 or 50 shale plays, but there are certain shale plays where the major oil companies have decided to put in massive infrastructure. One is the Haynesville, and I think that discovery was back in the late 90s. Uh, the problem with this is it's a very deep, expensive reservoir, but I want to show you the size and the scope. This is part of it, is that when you look at the, uh, the size and the scope of the Haynesville, Bossier area, it's pretty significant. It covers most of East Texas, travels over the Louisiana border, and it's got several layers, meaning at different depths. So there's a lot of gas. It's, it's a great play. It just happens to be a little more expensive than others. Oops, wrong way, sorry. Marcellus. I know probably least about the Marcellus than any of the plays. I just never had an interest in the Marcellus. It was, it was good, decent BTU gas. Steve and his company loved the Marcellus. <laughs> they did very well up there on their, on their pipeline. But at the time, what I didn't like about it is the terrain was tough. The drilling was hard to get your equipment in and out of. The infrastructure was non-existent for the most part. And so it, was, it had to take very deep, patient pockets to play the Marcellus. And I think to some degree that's still the case. But it's huge. And when you look at where it's located in Pennsylvania and Maryland, when you look at where the proximity of that, that, that shell play is relative to a population density, the Marcellus is going to be great for the Northeast. It's going to provide a lot of gas, which is going to be very vital to helping them keep their utility bills and, and energy down. Granite wash play up in Oklahoma. You've got two or three plays happening. You've got the Woodford, the granite wash, uh, a number of plays in Oklahoma. But again, when you look at the scope of it, it's just this massive 
section in here that is just running, you know, across a couple, two or three, four hundred miles. So these are not little bitty plays. They're not just 50 acres or 1,000 acres or 10,000 acres. They're millions of acres uh, loaded with uh, saturated shale. The Woodford play up in Oklahoma, same thing, Eagleford shale. And this is a little bit of the interesting reason why the, the Eagleford is so tough, is the Eagleford is buried at a, uh, a significant depth. And so when they started drilling, what they realized is that the Eagleford had a specific differential between wells that are drilled along this green strike are very heavy in crude oil, very high BTU gas. Everything in yellow is a combination of high gas with a lot of liquids associated with it. And everything down in the red is primarily just dry kind of BTU gas. So when you start looking at the economics, the, the initial rush was to lease everything you could lease. What they finally came down to is said, look, this is all about economics. We'd re much rather drill up in the oily window and continue to, to move forward from that. So I think the Eagleford has a lot of uh, sad stories coming out of it, depending on where you leased. If you're in the gas section, you're not going to be near as happy. If you're in the oily window, you're going to be a lot more happy and obviously better economics. Uh, I went the wrong way again, sorry. I'm moving my thumb. Okay, well, I'm going to focus a little bit on the Bakken because that's the one I've been involved in for over a year and I've got the most information on. This is not a sales pitch, it's informational. By the way, does anybody have any questions? I'll take a breath there. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Everybody still awake? Okay, good. Perfect. Okay. The Bakken is, is kind of an interesting play to me because when I look at the North Dakota, Montana area, what I like, it's very much like the, the Marcellus. It's kind of virgin territory. It doesn't have massive infrastructure. It doesn't have a lot of the components like the Marcellus, but the reason I did decide to go to the uh, Bakken was because I believe the, the amount of oil that's in place, which I'm, I'm a, prone, uh, a proponent of oil, was just massive, and it continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I mean bigger in the fact of reserves, bigger in the side of geographical dimensions, based on the stacked number of reservoirs that are being discovered. So when I look at the Bakken, to me, it tells me we're in an area that we could be in for the next 20 years and not even come close to scratching the surface. It's like, I believe, South Texas was 20 years ago. Uh, the state's friendly, the documentation's transparent, it, it's got all the components that I liked, but most of it, most importantly, is it has that carbon content factor that I was describing a while ago. You're finding a lot of oil and gas in place for every time you drill a well. Every black dot on this map represents a penetration of oil and gas wells into the Bakken, whether they produced shallow or deeper. So again, I want to fish where there's a lot of fish. So we had a focus, and our focus was to be in an area that was surrounded by the majority of the trend, we had a very defined area of mutual interest. We looked at the structural component of where we thought the oil was going to be the most uh, prominent, and we started going out buying leases last December. I want to say at this point we're involved in probably 40-plus wells. I think we have eight or nine drilling right now, Donnie, something like that. I mean, my email is loaded every day with wells. We're drilling with only the majors up there. Uh, the terms we get are great. We're getting wells drilled very, very quick. Uh, at this point, it, it's giving me all the things that I wanted to see that I didn't see inside the Marcellus, which was infrastructure being developed, quick return on money, very quick activity and operation. When you look at it from a 3D seismic perspective, the Bakken really is not, I wouldn't call it a blanket reservoir, but it's a continual reservoir that covers virtually the entire state to some degree. And it's going to cover it in the Bakken reservoirs themselves, which is three layers of the Bakken. You have the Sanish and the Three Forks reservoir below it. And so I kind of, I liken this particular play to what we saw in South Texas. In South Texas, we had shallow oil plays uh, 4,500 to 5,000 feet in the Almas formation, Almas formation. Then they started discovering wells down in the Austin Chalk between 7 and 10,000 feet deep and made millions and millions of barrels from the Austin Chalk. And then here they come back and they find additional reservoirs in the, uh, the Eagleford Shale 20, 30 years later, and they're saying the Eagleford is going to be 5 or 10 times bigger than the, than the Austin Chalk was, which produced 70, 80 million barrels of oil. What I see happening in the Bakken is the same thing. Everybody's drilling to the Bakken now because it's the shallowest, cheapest reservoir. We're now, our company and our partners that are involved are now involved in three forks wells, which are slightly below the Bakken. And to me, it looks like the decline curves are less than the Bakken. So it tells me they're better wells. So I believe that from, from a shale perspective, the Marcellus really only has one main member. The Eagleford has only one main member, meaning one reservoir. At least with the Bakken, we got multiple reservoirs, so that means the continue of adding reserves over a long period of time is much, much in our favor, much to our favor. Uh, I, hope you, I hope you can see the photograph. I thought this was funny when I, when I pulled the slide. Uh, in plagiarism, this came off another PowerPoint. I couldn't figure out how to get the picture off, so I'm going to just keep the picture with the other person's slide. But if you look at the trucks coming out, this is what uh, North Dakota looks like right now. Trucks coming in, trucks coming out. Moving equipment in, hauling oil out. And if anybody's an oil and gas investor, that's a beautiful sight right there. Uh, if you've not been on a location, my favorite smell is rotten eggs. You walk out there, you crawl up on that tank, you smell rotten eggs, and 
for new people who've never been there, go, oh, that just smells terrible. I want to stick my head down the side of it because it's beautiful. So when I look at pictures like this, what's interesting is North Dakota Bakken's production is 300,000 barrels per day. You remember the statistic from about eight slides ago that said, we'll peak at 6 million, we'll drop back to 5.7 million barrels according to the EIA. Fact is the Bakken's at 300,000, but they think the Bakken could be easily 700,000 to a million barrels a day by the time it's fully developed. We, we're talking millions and millions of acres in the Bakken. So the good thing is we have an answer if we can drill it fast enough and we need a lot more trucks or pipeline and I think we'll be addressing some of those pipeline considerations in our four o'clock presentation. Now this, I didn't create this slide so this is not my sales pitch, but the slide was very clear. How many Bakkens are there? Now I don't know if you can see at the bottom, but you're talking uh, 900,000, I think it's 900,000 million barrels of oil uh, down in the Eagleford and they're saying the Bakken may have 40 billion barrels. Now you can go to the United States Geological Society, of USGS, and it gives you statistics. I mean that's the so-called experts. And what they continually keep doing is increasing the amount of reserves they expect to come out of the Bakken trend. And so, again, I want to fish where I can go find the biggest fish. If I'm trying to throw darts at a board, i got a better shot up here than I do down here. Now, I will tell you the Eagleford is massive in size. It's going to be a great play for those who can stay in the early window. But now you have a new shell play out here called the Monterey, and you've got the Nibrera, which is also showing some very promising signs at a shallower depth. So the key to this is, is that if you're going to play shale, you got to decide gas or oil. If you're going to play gas or oil, you got to decide where you're going to be. Um, I'm just trying to make it simple on myself by going to the biggest spot. Hammock Oil Company, our oil company, has been drilling wells. I think we started our first well in February. We got our first AFE notice and, and, and drilling our first well. So far, we're involved with about six or seven of the majors. That list is double now, meaning we're down to people like Petrohunt and Oasis and others that were not on this list. So we're probably involved with about 10 to 12 of the major operators in the Bakken. And I'll tell you one reason why I think it's important for us. We're taking small pieces of wells, but if you take any one of those companies on that chart and you went and said, okay, Mr. EOG engineer, what do you know about the Bakken? He's going to know about the wells he's in, whatever public data is out there, or whichever wells he's a partner in, or that engineer is a partner in, when EOG partners with somebody else in that well. Hammock Oil Company has the advantage of the fact that we're in all these wells under the joint operating agreement, the agreement that binds us to participate in the well, we have the advantage of getting all the data on all the wells that we're in from every company. So we can correlate data from well to well. Why is uh, XTO's daily output less? Why is Brigham's numbers 2,300 barrels a day? You know, why, why did this company drill 24 stage frack and this company drilled a 40 stage frack? So we get to see the well. We get, I mean, our files are this thick per well. It's just huge. I'll give you one short story because I, I think you'll appreciate the advantage we have by being a small player. Don Hamley, my partner, uh, gets on the phone and says, I'm going to call on our XTO well to find out what's going on with it. So he calls, gets through the operating department, he ends up talking to an engineer. What did you talk to, for like two hours? About two hours on the phone. The guy had no idea. We only, only owned a quarter of a point interest. Okay? But he said, Donnie says, we're a non-operated partner. We want to find out some statistics about our well. Goes, Great, let me tell you everything we want to know. Well, in two hours, he goes through the entire logistics of the well and explains exactly what they've done. And we found out a lot of valuable information about the differential between XTO's numbers and everybody else. And what they really were doing is they're only opening up about one third of their well bore, and everybody else is trying to open all their well bores up. So is XTO dumb, or are they just being cheap because they don't want to complete the rest of the well? Or maybe they're saying, we'll produce one third of the well bore now to hold our leases and make cash flow, but in about five or 10 years, when that price goes up to that $200 a barrel, we'll open up the back half of the well. Remember, they got a lot more money than we do, so they're more patient. But it makes sense when we're looking at leases to buy. On the surface, you say, well, I'd rather be in a Brigham well that's making 2,000 barrels a day. Why would I want to be next to XTO that's making 300 barrels a day? Maybe XTO really is a 2,000 barrel a day well, and Brigham's going to suck all the life out of the well very quick. We have to factor that into it. But that's how these shell plays are being developed and evolved. I know you guys are tired after lunch. I see a couple of eyes shutting, so I'll try to keep the pace moving. Um, this is just a good little schematic to help you understand exactly what we're doing. We're, uh, we're drilling well straight down uh, vertically. And then we're uh, turning horizontally, and we have horizontal capabilities going in what they call dual directions, meaning we take a vertical well down, we can go either direction, we can do stacked laterals, meaning one on top of the other in separate reservoirs, we can drill stacked laterals in totally separate reservoirs, meaning the three forks of the Bakken. So the advantage is this technology has allowed us to do just about anything. I mean, wells that you thought you could never drill, they're able to do that. So technology again is the driver. The other thing that uh, is good to point out is that when you look at a, a lease position, Okay, if you drill a well down in the Eagleford, you might take up 1,280 acres, two sections of land to drill one horizontal well. Some of these uh, shell plays are so saturated, you might get five, six, seven wells per 1,280 acres. And each well in its own right might have three, four, five hundred thousand barrels of oil.
So what I want to do is I want to rocket down this thing. Okay, FSH midstream. Let me see a show of hands who's in FSH midstream. Okay, great. Do a capsulization to catch everybody else up. Um, we said this yesterday, but at the end of the day, Diane Dundee and Ann Keller brought us an idea to buy existing cash flowing active pipelines in the Gulf of Mexico. And the idea was to buy pipelines that uh, we felt like we could convert the pipelines from a federally regulated line to an unregulated line. This is a crazy story, but if you, have to, if you follow it real quick, I can probably get everybody caught up to speed. When you are a FERC regulated line, your fees are set. You have utility boards who agree to pay a certain price for gas locked in based on a, a utility agreement. Their customers, the homeowners, are guaranteed a certain price that they pay for the utility. It's all done by public utility boards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody that has a FERC regulated line has massive rules and regulations on what they can charge. It's basically a guaranteed arbitrage from the price they pay for gas and what they're going to sell it for, so they pretty much know their profit margin. In the Gulf of Mexico, the in, in order to get oil companies to come out here and drill these big, deep, expensive wells, they had to be assured that somebody was going to pipe their gas, get it on the shore, and get it sold for them. Why would I go drill a $180 million well without having pipelines? Well, did that, did that turn it off? No. Sure. Okay. All right, so the, at the end of the day, uh, utility companies up in the Northeast who needed the gas for heating and fuel were saying, we need gas and energy to heat our homes. The pipeline company said, well, we're not going to lay a billion dollar pipeline from New York to Texas unless we're guaranteed that you're going to take our gas on long-term contracts at a fixed price. But the utility, the pipeline company said, well, we're going to get this gas from. Well, three-party agreement. You oil companies that are drilling, go drill in the Gulf. We'll pick up your gas and transport it, get it on shore, and we won't charge you a fee for it. In turn, we're going to have all this gas commitment, and we're going to ship it to the Northeast, and the utility comes and agree to pay us a certain price. So everything was pretty well locked in under a FERC-regulated line. When you really think about it, the pipeline company doesn't want to own the pipe. They don't care about the pipe. They don't want the pipe. What they want is they want that arbitrage on that gas price and that liquids price. They want to make the spread. They, what they want is the commodity inside the pipe. So as they put these pipes in 30, 40 years ago, they have actuarially calculated the depreciated value of the pipelines. They figured out that they're self-insured for hurricane damage. And after a while, they build, in our case, the five pipelines we're buying has a capacity of $2 billion a day. They take the $2 billion a day, and now it's down to what they showed a year ago, $399 million. So it's producing literally less than 25% of volume or capacity. So what is Tennessee Gas looking around? They're saying, we got all these pipelines. We're self-insured. we got to maintain all these pipelines. And so uh, really the value to us is not the pipelines. We just need the gas, the $399 million. What can we do? Well, why don't we sell all the pipelines from the, the collection point on shore? Let's sell all the pipelines out in the Gulf of Mexico to somebody else because it's still going to bring the gas to our collection point. We're still going to get what we want, which is the gas, to go to the northeast. Well, how is anybody going to make money on a pipeline when you don't get to charge a fee to the producer? So who, who's going to buy a, an asset with no cash flow? Well, giving credit to my partners, because I take none of the credit on this, Ann and Diane had the idea that under the uh, FERC guidelines, certain pipelines do not meet uh, regulatory uh, FERC requirements, meaning that you can own a pipeline that's not FERC regulated if it has a certain criteria. They felt that from the, from the shoreline back out in the water, these particular five systems did not have to be regulated. They did not have to be FERC guidelines. So our proposal was to go to Tennessee, buy these pipelines, convert them based on regulatory, uh, statutory uh, uh, classification, go to FERC and say, these lines do not qualify for FERC lines. We want to take them out of FERC guideline and put them into private uh, gathering lines because they're really gathering lines. They're not transportation lines because we're going from the wellhead to a collection point. So they truly are gathering, not transportation. We got Tennessee to agree to a contract. We started the contract process. I want to say we signed it, I'm going to guess, January of 2010. Yeah. Th things have been going so fast the last two years, I don't like, it seems like time flies. But it was January 2010. So we, put under, we get under contract, successfully negotiated to buy these pipelines, five pipeline systems covering about 800 miles in the Gulf, five individual systems with 600 wells and 135 operators coming to these lines with an assumed volume of 399 million cubic feet of gas a day. We get an exclusive agreement with, with uh, Tennessee Gas. We're going to buy the pipelines for $15 million. And uh, with that, we get their platforms, all their equipment. We find out in our due diligence that they have them on their books valued at $225 million. 
replacement cost alone for the pipelines is well over a quarter of a billion dollars. And so you're thinking, we're going to get them for $15 million? Well, why are we going to get them for $15 million? They're probably spending $15 million a year in insurance and coverage and, and maintenance and care on a pipeline. They're getting zero value for it. Because remember, they can't charge a fee back to the producers. So what they've done is they're getting the gas they want, but they're taking all their profit or a lot of their profit off their gas arbitrage, and they're having to maintain the lines, which they don't want to own. Our idea was simply as follows. Buy the pipelines, convert them from regulated to deregulated, go back to the producers. As a gathering line, you get to charge a fee. In the Gulf of Mexico, the average fee is 22 cents up to 78 cents an MCF. So we figured if we had a model, we got it deregulated, we charged like 17 cents an MCF. Nobody could complain that we're charging an unfair fee because we're, we're below the normal. Um, you add that volume at 17 cents, we should pay these lines out in 18 to 24 months. Um, the other thing is, is Tennessee was not going out and trying to get new pipelines. They, unless you just came knocking on the door and said, we drilled the well, please take our gas. Tennessee was not out trying to hustle because El Paso has had all kinds of financial problems. As an example, when we first started buying the lines, there may have been 20 people in the divestiture team. I don't think we have an, a single person left on that team that was there a year and a half ago. They've all been fired, let go, or whatever. We're down to some new kid that's about 28 that's just doing what Diane tells him to do. Uh, but the point is, is that they were not trying to get new business. We see the pipelines as being a quarter of a billion dollar asset that we're going to pay after due diligence. We knocked the price down to $10 million. Okay, So we're down to $10 million for the pipelines. We see this as a $2 billion a day, pristine shape pipeline system with production platforms, it's not production platforms, it's gathering platforms, uh, no production. We never take possession of the gas or oil. We got onshore facilities. We have all this set in place in what? All we need is gas. We need gas and liquids. So what are we good at? What's Troy good at? We're good at business. We're good at recruiting customers. So Diane and Ann and, and Gary Woods and Mr. McCombs, we're looking at this going, this is simple. You're going to give me $2 billion a day? Our goal is real simple. Buy the pipelines, get them converted through uh, FERC, which I'll go to in a minute, and then at that point in time, how do we fill those pipelines? Because every single additional MCF of gas is just pure net bottom line profit. So this is going to be simple. Buy the lines, you get them filled. Where we stand today, I'm not going to make, uh, make this too long, but we've had a lot go on in the last year and a half in the Gulf of Mexico. Biggest spill in the history of the world as far as oil spills. And I'm sitting there looking at Macondo wells pouring up oil out of the uh, ground. I'm not worried about the pigeon. I'm thinking, yeah, there goes a $100 million investment down the toilet because we're not going to be able to buy our pipelines, right? At the end of the day, uh, Macondo's over, didn't affect us. We've not had any issues. We find out in due diligence that the pipelines are not moving 399 million, they're moving 524 million. We find out that looking back over 10 years of history, we're not in this 16% decline curve. Basically, our production throughput has been constant. So we're looking at all of our models have changed. It looks much, much better. We've added really high insurance cost in our model because we, we have no idea what the insurance in the Gulf of Mexico is going to be going forward because of the Macondo spill. So we automatically put in from $2 million in insurance, $7 million into our model. We're like, we're going to really be you know, charged three times the price. We lowered our volumes. We've been conservative on our fees. Mr. McCombs and Gary Woods, his president, are, are worth a billion dollars for a reason. They squeeze, and they squeeze, and they squeeze, and they make smart decisions. Their whole premise on buying this pipeline as our 75% partner was one thing. Don't give me any blue sky. I want to know the worst case space. If I'm going to spend my share of a $40 million asset, you by God better tell me what the worst case scenario is. That's where we think we're at. We think that the worst case scenario is what we've been presenting to everyone. That is, we're going to buy the lines. We'll probably end up having 450 to 550 million a day in gas throughput when we close. Uh, we've done everything we can do. It's in FERC's hands right now. We should have been on the docket. We were hoping to be on the docket uh, th Thursday this last week. We, we're very confident we'll be on the docket in October. When you're on the docket in FERC in D.C., that simply means you've been put on as an agenda item. It then goes to public announcement. I think that takes 30 or 45 days. If there's no objections to it, which there might be one or two just little miscellaneous objections or whatever, you handle those, and then you get your stamp and approved, right? I'm figuring sometime between November, December, we should get approval for our deregulation process. Not one thing has come back yet that indicates we will not get approved. The questions came back from FERC were pretty ancillary. You know, what kind of coffee are you having this morning? We had objections from right off the bat from Exxon, from uh, all the producers, the bigger producers, like, because why? They've been getting free tra transport and free throughput, and all of a sudden now we're going to charge them 17 cents. They're like, approve, you know, disapprove, disapprove. Ann and Diane got every one of them taken away. All of them are gone. Because why? We went back to all the producers and said, look, you've been selling to Tennessee Gas as a regulated line, but you don't have compression. 
You don't get to blend your gas. We don't get to do uh, all the different things we can do as far as processing because in a FERC line, it's real simple. It's line spec. It's dry gas. It's this. You don't get to blend. It's very strict guidelines and rules. We get to go back to the producers and say, you know what? We can blend the gas and we can do whatever we need to. We can process before it gets to that collection point. So we can give you all these extra services. We can lower the line pressure to let you get more gas into the lines, which is nice. They can produce more gas. And we're going to do all this. And by the way, you really have been getting charged a lot more than our fee is going to be because when Tennessee gets you there, they take your gas spec and discount your gas price you're getting paid based on that collective value at that point. When they ran the numbers, we're going to charge them 17 cents or 20 cents or 30 cents. We're going to negotiate the best price we can operator by operator, but let's assume it's a 17 cents uh, average cost. Ann and Diane were clearly showing them that you're probably being charged, charged closer to 50 cents to a dollar in MCF by the time Tennessee's finished with you. So all the protests were, were withdrawn. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> we can't wait for Connecticut. As a matter of fact, they, they took their protest away and started going in favor of us, telling FERC, we want Connecticut to buy the pipeline. We're a solution maker, not a problem. So at this point, um, and, I, and I, I have to be candid with you, it seems like every week a, a, a Diane and myself are on the phone talking about some particular, particular issue, this, that, this has been like dragging an elephant up the Grand Canyon on my back because it's very complicated. We couldn't have two better partners than Ann and Diane because, I mean, that woman has put in 100 hours a week straight now for two years. She's, she's awesome. But optimistically, every single time it's like we're going to get this deal done, we're going to get that elephant out of this canyon, and we're going to be able to get on with our lives. Because at the end of the day, if it was easy, somebody else would have already done this. It's difficult because what you're really doing is you're changing the entire Gulf of Mexico from the standpoint of considering FERC regulated lines to deregulated lines. Now, with bated breath, there's about 50 pipeline companies standing there waiting to see if we get deregulated. Because they're going to take our model and our proof of concept and they're going to jump on every other system in the Gulf that looks just like that. And that's why it's such a big issue. It's a big issue because from the producer's point of view, that means every gathering line in the Gulf now is going to have a fee associated with it, right? From the flip side of it is, we're in a highly regulated environment in the government. So you're asking them to deregulate and take out of their control these pipelines. But why does it make sense? Because effectively, um, the deregulation, they don't like all these gathering lines. What they really want to do is regulate that main transportation FERC line that Tennessee owns. They're going to get their fees anyway, and they're going to get their control once it gets to shore. They don't need to control our, our stuff. At this point, it looks like we're going to have all in about $22, $23 million between buying the software, the helicopters, the, all the stuff we need to buy, the, you know, the whole nine yards, including the $10 million acquisition. It looks like we're, we originally had in our abandonment about $24.3 million for the abandonment. Now, the way the abandonment works is as follows. We hired an engineering firm. You go in and you evaluate if you had to pull all the pipeline out, get rid of all the production platforms, and sell them off and, and, and abandon them, what would it cost? It was like $46 million net present cost, $24.3 uh, $24 million, right? Or is it 23.7? One of the two. Let's say $24 million. What we had to do is we had to show what the abandonment was because what Tennessee had been telling all the utility companies up northeast is it's going to cost a quarter of a billion dollars to abandon these pipelines. Now they've got to go back to their customers and say, we've been charging you for 30 years to set aside this quarter of a billion dollars for abandonment, and now this new buyer, this Connecticut, shows they can get rid of it for $23 million. What do they do with that other $200 million? That was one of our struggles last year, is how the utility companies were going to go tell their board members that we've been charged by Tennessee the equivalent of a quarter billion dollar setback, and now it really shows it's only worth $23 million. From our standpoint, as a company, Connecticut, we expected to have our cash flow accumulate over the first 24 months the $23 million out of cash flow for the abandonment. Well, that all changed when the Macondo spill. Insurance companies weren't going to insure. We literally would not be able to buy this pipeline if we did not have Red McCombs as our partner. They have so much insurance business that when they went to the underwriters, because of all of his other businesses, he said, I need this insured. And like, oh, nobody's insuring anything in the Gulf of Mexico. Are you nuts? we got a well-flowing 5,000 barrels killing ducks by the minute. We were able to go and use his clout to go to those insurance companies, and we got that insurance in place. That was huge because right now people are still being denied insurance in the Gulf as a result of the Macondo. They want to know your, your financial stature. When I went into El Paso, you think Troy Ecker was going to get the attention of El Paso? No. I sat in there and said, here's Gary Woods McComb, and they had a board meeting with 25 people, and they said, all right, tell us a little bit about your background. So I tell them about my background and what we do. I'm the fly. And then Gary goes, well, we own $800 million worth of production. We're in the Gulf. We own insurance. And I go, okay, okay. You guys are financially qualified. The addition of that financial clout came in the insurance. We could not have gotten the insurance. The other thing is, it doesn't hurt for Red McCombs to pick the phone up and talk to the CEO of El Paso, who he's friends with, and just says, you know, this is taking a little longer than it should, fellas. Can you round up your team? 
and we've gotten a couple of issues where it seemed like they were dragging their, their tails, and about an hour after the phone call, we're getting emails and phone calls and getting things moving very quickly. So I can't tell you how much the advantage of having this guy as our partner has been because I'm very honored to be his partner, but it's really been helpful for us. Uh, also very helpful in the price we're paying. Today, it's in front of FERC. We have hired Stevens Investment Banking out of Little Rock, Arkansas, to be our investment banking firm for two reasons. One, we wanted to go secure a $35 million credit facility, which gives us the final dollars to close, the, the, ten, the $9 million we need to close on. It also provides us working capital, because we're going to be hooking up new pipelines and new wells. And we think it's going to give us plenty of money to have all of our surety bond paid for, because it's an operating cost of business. So my expectation at this point is that Stevens will successfully get us our $35 million. In my opinion, it's about a 99% chance that we're going to have the final cost and the surety bond covered in that, and we won't have to make any additional cash calls. Look, look at that. It goes right down, 99%. Eckert said it. Put it down. <laughs> yeah. Donnie, anything, nothing's changed on that assumption. We're still assuming at least four of the five should be good. The one system is, is, is a 50-50 shot on whether it gets deregulated, correct? Uh, the, uh, our original model showed three out of five, we'd do it at least. And then we had kind of in there, we might not get the other two, but it looks like from, uh, Diane and Ann just did a great job going before the FERC Regulatory Committee. I mean, they just, they, they know what they're doing and they presented the case of why it should be deregulated. I don't, have not heard anything that indicates over the last six months that any one of the lines will not be deregulated, but we still have in our model that possibly one or two would not be regulated. So let's kind of go, let's, let's push forward just a little bit. Let's talk about cash flow, let's talk about cash calls, and let's talk about expectations. Um, if we have our $35 million credit facility, and there's a good news, bad news. The good news is we weren't on the docket this month. I mean, the bad news was we weren't on the docket because we want to buy the pipelines as quickly as possible. The good news is by not being on the docket, it gives Stevens the opportunity to go get the $35 million before we close so we don't have to come out of pocket with any money. Because some of the partners were saying, I need to sell out because I thought I was going to put in $330,000, now I'm up to $600,000. Some partners bought three or four units, and uh, I know Mr. Morgan owns four units, and he's going, you know, his health is failing. He's looking at a $2 million cash call. I'm going to try to get some new partners to replace him. So, uh, Mark, what I was talking to Ethan about and stuff is we've got about eight or nine partners in the pipeline that really need to cash out because of health reasons. I mean, we've got uh, two big partners that are on, I think, collectively seven or eight units that need to cash out because they're both their health is failing tr tremendously. So what we're planning on doing is offering a Class C participation. It's just a different class, which you could buy in right now into the pipeline venture, uh, taking out existing partners that are in. What we've told the partners is we're looking at about a 30% profit margin on what they've already got in because of the risk they took. Buy them out, take their position. Now, I can tell you that if you can afford to stay, you need to stay. All the risk is pretty much done. I mean, you've taken the, the biggest risk was the initial money we put up to see if we can get the darn thing approved and, and bought. So this two-year path, we're now just about to get approval. I, I wouldn't want to sell unless you absolutely have to. But if you think you need to sell, we're going to try to get you back a 30% profit. I'm going to try to do a fair assessment. I want to be fair to the new partners, but I want to be very fair to the partners who took the risk uh, because I think that the line of credit is going to pretty much pay the rest of our cash call. Now, what I'm looking at is that Diane's uh, pretty pragmatic about how things look. She says, if we get approval, let's say November, it's 30 days for contracts, the final closing, and then you close 30 days later. So I'm looking at possession maybe earliest February 1st, more likely March or April. I mean, what I've learned in the pipeline business is it costs twice as much, takes twice as long. That's what, what, what's happening, okay? I'm saying we take possession the end of the first quarter. Now, here's the good news. We cash flow from day one. We've got $500 million a day in gas coming through. How do we know we're going to get our cash flow? How do we know we're going to get paid our fee? You don't pay me, I go shut your well in. <laughs> this is a great scenario. For I think I did that. This is a great scenario from the standpoint. Am I off? Yeah, boomer. What happened? Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. <laughs> I love sarcasm. It's so good. What happens now is, is that we'll probably take possession in January, February. Uh, we cash flow immediately. What our business model shows is we're going to set aside approximately 90 days worth of overhead cost. We already have that built in our model. So when we put together your potential investment, we factored in 90 days of overhead. We want to operate for, for at least six months, make sure we have our overhead cost assumed correctly. We'll then set that aside for 90 days, and then we'll start distributions probably within six months. So I'm looking at cash flow starting probably the third or fourth quarter of 2012, and then it's every quarter. Because in our joint venture agreement, 
McCombs doesn't get any money until we get our money. He's our 75% partner. We're 25%. I know Mr. McCombs. He's a great guy, but he's a billionaire for a reason. He likes money like we do. And they're highly motivated about keeping costs down and about making sure cash flow starts quickly. So um, I would estimate we get cash flow starting in the third or fourth quarter of next year. But let's talk about the, 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 the scenario that I see happening. If you think about the multiples paid for, for pipelines, we've got a $250 million asset. We're paying about $15 million for it. Uh, replacement costs a quarter of a billion dollars. We're going to be cash flowing, it looks like about 19 to $25 million a year in cash flow. If insurance stays where it's at, we're going to knock off another 2 or $3 million worth of value. Uh, the other piece of the news is the Davy Jones McMoran well ended up being directly underneath one of our pipelines. So the same week we got our exclusive agreement, McMoran announced the biggest gas discovery in the Gulf of Mexico. It happens that it's the most empty line that we have. So Diane and Ann did a great job and negotiated to get McMoran to commit to a brand new pipeline company called Kinetica, our line, our company, got them to commit the first $200 million in gas goes to our pipeline to us. We beat out Chevron on the final bid, and they got it signed about a month and a half ago. So if I've got three TCF of gas, and I get the contract from the people who own it, and it's sitting right underneath me, that's a 30 to 40 year reservoir life, uh, I'd say that pipeline's going to be pretty full for a long time. As a matter of fact, they're anticipating a billion a day coming out of that one field. So we've already had discussions about our investing another 30 or $40 million to run a parallel line 16 or 36 inch line to pick up the rest of the gas. Uh, that's the good news. What's the other good news? The other good news is, I'm going to use a map for this. I'm going to try to skip down. The other good news is that when you look at where all five of our pipelines are located, I'm going to get there real quick. When you look at where all five of our pipelines are located, it's right where all these new geological discoveries are being made. So we just couldn't have hit a better spot, a better location, a better pipeline, and better location. And I'll show you real quick. Game changer. Well, of course, you see the Davy Jones where it's at. So our pipeline runs directly across it. I love looking at those logs. Could have used a few of those about five years ago. The Gulf of Mexico is a, is a magical play, but it is, it is definitely a big boy's game. I mean, that is just money is no object. Uh, so for the, the partners that are interested in getting in the pipeline venture that did not get in originally, I would expect we'll have a Class C offering out in about two weeks. And in that offering, we'll tell you that there's a chance we won't get our uh, backing by Stevens Investment Bank, because we, until we get the money, I don't have it. But I'm going to tell you what your obligations are if you want to participate, but then I'll also tell you that if we get the financing, your obligation is going to be about 25% because the uh, financing will take care of your cash call. And you know the only reason why anybody's getting out at this point, here we go. The only reason why anybody's getting out at this point really is they just can't, they couldn't afford it or their health. And it's about eight or nine of the uh, 25 partners that just can't, can't stick with it. So again, our area of focus was in what they call the, uh, the Central Gulf. And if you look at the activity, that's where all the activity really is located. Um, our five pipelines are Sabine Pass, Cameron, South Marsh, South uh, Timbalier, and uh, South Pass. The capacity when we put the contract was $399 million. So we based our financial modeling on $399 million. In fact, it was doing $524 million. So we had a bump of 30-something percent in volume, and that's all revenue because every, every MCF is just free money. Um, has a capacity of 2.1 billion a day. The South Marsh system is right here, and the Davy Jones, there's a little line right there. The Davy Jones is found right underneath that uh, particular pipeline. Uh, the other thing is, if you look at those geological formations from McMoran, they all sit right here. So, couldn't be in a better spot. Um, this is some of our platforms to show you. I mean, you think about what the cost is just for one of these platforms to make. We picked up the entire 864 miles, all these platforms, onshore facilities for $10 million. Just incredible. People are like, yeah, something's got to be wrong. Where's the skunk in the closet? I don't know, but it's not here today. Okay. Um, I didn't have too much on that, but what I wanted to tell you is, is that um, this has been an interesting project, but let me tell you where I think we're going to end up going. FERC will approve us. We'll get our pipelines. We'll take possession in February. We'll cash flow this, uh, the third quarter of next year. Uh, based on the cash flow model in five years, we'll have been paid out maybe two times, maybe three times our money based on the model, uh, about two and a half, three times. Uh, at the same time is when you look at the exit strategy, which is going to be exited probably in five to six years, uh, based on the cash flow, it should put the value of those pipelines somewhere between $125 to $200 million in value, just based on cash flow. Now, that's without adding new gas. We added McMoran's $200 million a day. Now we're up to $724 million. We have all these other new discoveries, and so what I'm trying to point out is that in hooking up McMoran, our, our capital expenditure was virtually nil. They paid to hook us up the half mile they had to hook, hook us up, so we had no cost basis. All these other wells that get hooked up, you generally 
calculate into your hookup and your fee agreement that the producer is going to ultimately pay for that because if you write the check, they're going to get charged a higher fee for transport, so they're going to ultimately pay. With all this new activity, we're going to be real aggressive on business and market. We're going to go out and try to get this sucker full of about a billion to a billion and a half in gas. So let me help you with that model. The insurance is the insurance. It doesn't go up because you put more volume in it, right? Overhead's overhead. I got the same employees with the same computer software doing the same work, whether I move two billion a day or one billion a day. So our fixed costs are going to be pretty well in line. So every MCF that we add is going to be pretty much 80% bottom line net profit gain. We take it to a billion, billion and a half in revenue, we could be sitting on a billion dollar pipeline. That's why Mr. McComb is in this deal. He's not seeing this as a hundred million, hundred fifty million dollar venture. He was very clear to all the investment bankers that I was talking to because the problem is every time I went to an investment banker, they all want to do some kind of mezzanine participation. We'll lend you the money, but we want to have a quarter interest in the pipeline and we want to have an equity stake. And Gary Wood's comment every time he goes, we're not that broke. <laughs> you can lend us the money, but you're not going to get a piece of this deal. He wants all of it himself. So from the standpoint of, uh, of, of quality and value, we could have better people managing it. I don't, I don't do anything other than just watch Ann and Diane do their magic. We're gonna, we ended up picking up most of all the employees that worked in these pipelines the last 10 years with Tennessee. They're all, I think all but two are converting and coming with our company. They'll work for Connecticut. So we basically picked up an operating company, moved it under Connecticut. Everything's in place with the software. And I'm not going to understate the amount of work they're having to do because it's just massive. But at the same time, we've got a great team and they're, and they're doing a great job for us. So what we found was a great asset, undervalued. We, we're going to aggregate. And then our future is we now have at least three other systems in the Gulf that we're looking at that we, fee, we feel like meet our criteria. And we've already made one proposal to buy a, uh, an existing system. For those of you that are involved, know that system. And uh, we didn't get a chance. We did not get to buy it. We still are a player in buying that asset, probably between 50 and 60 million. We have two other systems we're looking at right now that'll be between 10 and 20 million dollars. Our goal is, is to add as much as we can and not be regulated. So we're gonna push the limit to where we think that FERC will not require us to be regulated and then we're gonna sell. We're gonna bundle, aggregate, and sell. I'm thinking we're exiting in three to five years. So I, I think that's where we're at. I'll take any questions on the Connecticut Pipeline venture at this point, if anybody has any questions about it. Uh, I know the two key questions are, when is the cash call coming, okay? I don't suspect we'll have the cash call till at least November, December, if there's one at all. Um, I, I'm working very closely with the two investment bankers at Stevens, know them real well, and they're extremely, they, they don't take a project unless they know they're going to fund it. So they're very confident they're going to have the money. Uh, if there's a cash call, it would be probably in November, December, and I'm not expecting possession until probably February. Uh, I'd like to hope and dream it would come faster, I just don't think it will. Uh, the other good news is that if we get through this hurricane season without any major damage, our insurance should drop by half. So that three or four million dollar savings goes straight to the, the net bottom line. So that's good news too. Any questions? And whoever's interested in the Class C units, um, personally, I think you're going to steal it if you can get it for the for the the price we're talking about. Because quite frankly, we had 100% risk that we'd never even get a regulator to get the pipelines bought. We had every probability of the of the deal falling apart based on a number of issues. But if you can buy into the pipeline now and know you have investment bankers that are going to put up the balance of your cash call, you're going to pick up a 1% participation in the pipeline for about $140,000. You do the math on that. It's a pretty good return. Pretty phenomenal return. I can make up a lot of dry hole losses for a lot of you guys by doing that participation. Uh, but if you have any interest, I'll need you to sign a confidentiality agreement. I'll get that out to you. You can sign it, and then we'll be glad to show you the financials and pro forma. Why today do we need the financial, the confidentiality agreement? Because all of our fee agreements with all of our producers, I don't want to go to Exxon and charge them 17 cents, and I try to go to Chevron, and I try to charge them 30 cents. Chevron goes, you only charge him 17 cents. So everything we're doing, we want to keep really tight and confidential with regard to all of our fee agreements. We'll tell you as our partners, but we want to make sure everybody keeps that contained because you don't know who you're sitting at the cocktail table with or who's sitting across listening to you at the Starbucks. We want to keep it confidential. I believe that we'll end up picking up another system or two in the next 12 months because Right now, the Gulf is not the favored place to be. Uh, multiples in the Gulf for pipelines are about four and a half to five. Rigs have been taken out. This is the perfect time for us to be in the Gulf buying assets. We need to be in there buying them at distressed values, and then we want to be a seller in three to five years when all this new gas comes online. So the original one share, what's the Send me for East Crown. Say it again. The original one share, uh -huh. share what's the tendency of those? It's only at three quarters. Yeah. You want the investment breakdown. Yeah, we have 25%. Right. So how many investors do we have to have 25%? Uh, well, there was 25 shares in the LLC, so there's 25 units. <coughs> so 25% represented 25 member units. Each member represented 1% of the deal. Okay? 
no, let, let me help you. So your original investment was $330,000 for 1%, which was the estimated cost to get us all the way through closing, okay? If we get the financing in place, you won't have that third cash call, which is the balance of your 330, and you won't have the surety bond cash call, which took you up to 560,000, okay? So the reason why it's 140,000 is that that's the current cost basis. Now, the 140,000 will also have to have the profit put on top of it for the share members who sell out. So it's going to be probably closer to $180,000 to get cash. It was my mistake. I didn't put that part on there. But the key is, is that there was 25 members. Everybody that participated gets their money back in a 15% return per annum, non-compounded, and then we have a back-end interest once everybody makes their money back. So the, the idea is that uh, Hammock Pipeline is at the back end, but the idea is to get everybody their money back in 15%, and that should occur within two years. Based on the model, it looks like we should be paid out in two years or less. It should be very quick. Okay? But for the new partners, you'll basically take their cost basis, about a 30% profit, and you'll be able to take them out for that 30% profit. So 180 to 190,000, something like that. I haven't run the numbers on it, and that would be a takeout point. But the, the way it's broken down is McCombs, and his, McCombs owns 65%. Gary Woods, his president, decided to personally take 10%. He's always had the right to buy in 10% of any deal he wants. Very rarely does he ever participate in a deal. And that's the, been the big uh, hubbub around the McCombs offices. This deal must be really, really good because Gary, who's known as a hard ass, uh, took 10% of the deal. So that's a stamp of approval in my book. So Gary owns 10% for his family. McCombs owns 65%. FSH Midstream bought the other 25%. We had 100%. And when I got Mr. McCombs to commit, Gary Wood just said, well, how much do you want us to put in? We're in. We want to be a partner. What do you want? And I said, what I need is your financial clout. You come in pair of dollar for dollar, you can have 75, we'll take 25. Because I knew we probably shot an elephant when I was out uh, shooting, you know, going for squirrel hunting, I shot an elephant. And if we hadn't had it, we never would have got this deal done. So. Okay, the sun's shining. Yeah. Uh, we, we were conservative on everything, now we're gonna be optimistic on the other end. Okay. Three to five year, we're saying hopefully you could almost create a value of a billion dollars. Yep. To see what our multiples are, like what do we, what's, what would anticipate, uh, what would we use projections for our cost basis when the deal's done? To Your basis will to be 140,000 per unit now. No, I mean like the whole company. Yeah. Are we basing that on 20 million, 30 million, 50 million? Um, to get to a billion dollar value, we're going to have to buy two or three additional systems. We might have a, a total cost basis of maybe 75 to 100 million in. Okay. But what I think is going to happen is, if we get Stevens to put up the $35 million, and there, I was going to tell you why we had Stevens in, involved with us, Stevens will be able to bring us the next $75 million when we buy the second asset, because we'll have a cash flowing property. The reason, the reason why it's tough to get financing now is there's no cash flow in those pipelines, because we never were able to charge a fee. It is a potential cash flow when you get FERC approval. If we had FERC approval, I could have walked in with a contract and said, we have this cash flow. Today, the investment banker is going to lend us the money before FERC approval. It'll be subject to FERC approval, but that's tough to get money borrowed when you don't have a contract in place, right? What we'll end up doing is, is that we'll take our current pipelines and we'll probably create a line of credit that says, maybe a $100 million line of credit that says, we want to go buy out system number two or system number three, we'll probably use our line of credit to buy it out and our cash flow will pay for it. So you literally could be in for a unit for 140000 which is your one unit investment right now. You could end up owning $100 million worth of pipelines and that's your basis, 140000 that's what McCombs is going to do. They're, they're, they're very good at leveraging their capital. So that's why I've tried to stress all along, be patient with us on FSH Midstream. Uh, I could go through example after example of letting my partners kind of put pressure on me to make decisions about exiting early. I'm not exiting the, the pipeline deal. Until FERC turns me down or the Gulf of Mexico gets caught on fire, uh, this is a home run and a half, and I'm not budging one iota on it. I'm, I'm just as excited about this as the Bakken because we found the golden tool, and it would not have happened if we didn't find two really smart partners in Ann and Diane. And uh, they're going to make it happen, and we're going to buy some more pipelines. And I, you know, billion dollars sounds like, well, that's kind of ridiculous. You know, is that really a true number for, for what we can do? Um, I can tell you the answer is no, and here's why. When we were looking at buying the TransCanada system, now some of you uh, remember this conversation, TransCanada uh, system put us all the way to the edge of the continental shelf, so it put us from deep water to shallow water. Well, where are all the big plays coming from? Deep water, all these new reserves and new oil and gas. We had the ability to do a joint venture with another major midstream company where they came to us back in February and said, look, if you end up getting this system, we need access on this shelf to get our oil and gas out of the deep water to the shore. What we'd like to do is give you some consideration. If you're successful in picking up the TransCanada system, uh, we want you to maybe consider a joint venture where you commit all of your sh uh, shelf pipeline, 
we'll commit our deep pipeline, we'll throw it into one joint venture, and the number they used was, we'll give you a $750 million value, we'll throw ours in at $750 million, and we'll create a $1.5 billion joint venture. So we're not pulling numbers out of our backside, this is what they're telling us. Now, TransCanada decided to roll up those pipelines and they want to spin it off in a stock deal. Um, we still think we have a very good shot at buying those pipelines, but it's going to be six months down the road because uh, the Canadians were a little hard-headed and we have no clue why they're trying to roll up into a stock venture. And McCombs doesn't like the stock deal. Can't depreciate the equipment. We can't, the tax advantages are not there. So he's very much conscious about the stock side of it. So what I would tell you is, is that whether we end up doing this joint venture on deep water, there's several systems that give us a strategic position on collecting gas and oil from these new fields. It's all about volume. Just your five systems, if we take it to 1.2, 1.5 billion a day, when you look at the cash flow, let's say it's 30, 40 million dollars a year, take it times eight, take it times 10, take it times 12. It's a pretty big number pretty quick for very little cost.